This conference will now be recorded. <laughs> okay, I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. All right. It's 6.05. Um, so I'm going to call the meeting to order. Hopefully those who are missing will join us shortly. Uh, Dr. Hilton, will you please call the roll? Yes, absolutely. Um, Joe Meeks? Here. Up here? Here. Michael James? Here. Uh, Craig McRae? Here. Cedric Leonard? Dr. Lassiter? Here. Mike Wigley? Here. And Claudia Hartness? Michael James is going to give our invocation tonight. And um, if we'll stand and observe that and remain standing, I'll lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. The flag, I'll try to position my camera so you can see it behind me. Let us pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father. We come to you this time, Father, seeking your guidance and your wisdom in the decisions that we make for this city. We pray, Father, for your healing mercies upon all those gracious God that are in need. We especially, Father, want to lift up Craig's mother and pray that you can lead the doctors that are providing her care and provide that family with the comfort and the support that only you can provide. We pray, Father, that the decisions we make are in the best interest of all concerned. And we just pray that you will give us strength as we go through our days. These things we pray to you in your son's name. Amen. Amen. This conference will now be recorded. Will now be recorded. Will now be recorded. Will now be recorded. My camera is not going to move. We're not going to get the flag in its view, so we'll just pledge. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, which is stands one nation, one under God, one indivisible, with liberty and justice for all.
Okay, thank you all. Um, the first item on the agenda is the approval of minutes. I move for approval. Thank you. Can I get a second? Second. Thank you. Any discussion? Okay, all those in favor of approving the minutes for the uh, November 24th meeting, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed by the same sign. Okay, minutes are approved. Thank you. Mayor. Yes, sir. If I could, could I ask for a amendment of the agenda uh, to move the under new business, the resolution on the poet Lord uh, to the first item of business. So our guests will be excused from the meeting. Yes, sir. You can. Would you like to put that in the form of a motion? Yes, I would like to introduce a resolution declaring Dr. Robert Morris poet Lord of the city of Monticello. And would ask that it be read in its full. Okay. Dr. Hilton, would you like to read it or would you like for me to read that? Sorry, I'm having some connectivity issues here, so it'd probably be better if you can read that. I'm sorry. Let's get a second on the motion. Second. Second. Thank you. I'll read the resolution. And and thank you, Dr. Moore, for joining us tonight. A resolution appointing a poet laureate for the city of Monticello, Arkansas. Whereas Robert Moore, PhD, has served with distinction as a faculty member at the University of Arkansas at Monticello in the School of Arts and Humanities since August 1997. And whereas Dr. Moore was a Hotter Fellow at Princeton University, a fellowship given to artists and writers of exceptional talents to pursue independent projects in the academic year, and whereas Dr. Moore served UAM and his students in the academic rank of assistant professor from August 1997 until May 2002. He was promoted in May 2002 to associate professor and served until May 2007. He was promoted in May 2007 to professor and served until May 2020, at which time he retired. The University of Arkansas Board of Trustees granted him professor emeritus status effective May 31st, 2020. And whereas Dr. Moore is a gifted and accomplished poet and author who has written books of poetry and prose under the pen name Red Hawk, published by Holmes Press, Bright Hill Press, August House, Abadi Publishing, and Cleveland State University Press. And he has published in such magazines as The Atlantic Poetry, Atlanta Review, Shenandoah, Tampa Review, Rattle, The New York Quarterly, and Kenyon Review. And he has given readings with Allen Ginsberg, Rita Dove, Miller Williams, Tess Gallagher, Coleman Bank Barks, and more than 70 solo readings in the United States. And whereas published books by Red Hawk are Self Remembering, The Path to Non Judgmental Love, Practitioner's Manual, Mother Guru, Savitri Love Poems, Journey of the Medicine Man, the Way of Power, The Art of Dying, Wreckage with a Beating Heart, The Way of the Wise Woman, Return to the Mother, A Lover's Handbook, The Sioux Dog Dance, The Law of the Land, Raven's Paradise, Winner of the 2009 Bright Hill Press Reward, Self-Observant Observation, The Awakening of Conscious, an owner's manual published in 11 languages, including Chinese, Romanian, and Sub Serbian. And Red Hawk was awarded the 2014 Poet of the Sacred Competition by the Center for Interfaith Relations in Louisville, Kentucky. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Monticello, Arkansas City Council that Dr. Robert, Robert Moore be granted the title Poet Laureate for the City of Monticello, Arkansas, and be it further resolved that the council directs that this resolution shall be spread upon the minutes of this meeting and that a copy shall be provided to Dr. Moore. Adopted this 15th day of December, 2020. Okay, I have a motion and a second. Can, uh, Dr. Hilton, will you please call the roll? Uh, 
Joe Meeks. Yes. Cedric Leonard. Michael James. Yes. Al Pierre. Yes. Jack Lassiter. Yes. Craig McCray. Yes. Mike Wigley. Yes. And Claudia Hartness. Claudia Hartness. Okay. I think she's saying yes, we just can't hear her. <laughs> Give her a Dr. thumbs up. Moore, thank you so much. We're I'm very excited and I think we all are excited to have a poet laureate for Monticello. I don't know if it's the first. Um, I, I want to say thank you how deeply grateful I am for this gesture. It's a kind and generous gesture to poetry in general. It, it, it sends the message that poetry still has an important place in human life. Uh, I also want to give special thanks to Jesse, to Jack, and to Claudia, my dear, dear friends, who were our colleagues and friends of mine for many, many years. And also equally important, I, I want to recognize that this honor honors UAM, uh, the uh, beautiful university who, which uh, has an effect on all of our lives and has been such an influence on the life of many, many people for many years. In fact, a, a population which is underserved mainly, we have served them. So thank you for honoring UAM for me and for poetry. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Moore. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, God bless Robert. you. Thanks, Jack. You bet. <laughs> okay, next is uh, reports and presentations. And uh, so we're going to try to start with Bettina Randolph, but for some reason, she texted, it's not letting me in here. Her report is the following. Boys and, Club, Boys and Girls Club is doing well. We're glad to be COVID free thus far. We're ready for the break so we can get a deep sanitation for the new year. Our, our enrollment is still increasing. And all of our current students had good grades at progress report time. So, so that's Bettina's um, for the Boys and Girls Club. Mr. Boyce, are you? There you are. Are you prepared? Are you ready? Hey. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, just a couple items for this evening. Uh, by state code, two of the first tasks of a planning commission are to prepare a community study and to prepare a map. A community study, as I've uh, said before, we need to begin by getting input from the community and Thanks to the hard work of Nita McDaniel, we're going to start that in January. Nita will have more details in her report, but uh, thanks to her hard work, she got us an energy funded project, uh, no cost to us, coordinated by a group at the University of Central Arkansas that will be conducting a citywide survey uh, digitally and on paper in January. And that should give us just a tremendous basis on which to build our community study as we move forward. Um, we really, really appreciate Nita's hard work and, and that of the other community leaders uh, who have participated in putting this survey together. It's, it's just amazing. Um, as far as uh, planning map, I've been in conversation with the, the good folks at Eagle Forestry Services. And for that and for some other projects, it will be um, essential for our developing both the community study and eventually a plan for the city. And I believe that uh, the forestry made some other proposals to the council, which I, I are on the agenda for this evening. Um, Mr. Gilbert, I, I mentioned that completing those pro some other projects will help us, uh, help him in his making the planning mapping for us so we can um, kind of Piggyback onto what the, the city council decides to do. Um, that's with all sorts of aspects of the plan from population to build to property use to sidewalks and 
So we're really excited about some of those, those possibilities. Um, 2020 was kind of more, a little bit more challenging than we expected, of course, and um, we're looking forward to 2021. It's a really exciting project and um, things to bring to the council. We sure appreciate your support and your help as we go forward. And that's my report. Mr. Lewis, can I ask you a question? Sure. Okay. Um, with regard to the energy grant and the work that EFS is proposing, uh -huh. is the grant paying for any of that? No, the, the two are, are not. No, the, the two are, Mr. James. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? The two, the map and the survey are, are not connected. So that, that grant will not help with the mapping at all. I got you. Okay, thank you. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. I was, somebody oh. muted me, so, okay. Um, next is Senior Citizen Center, Ms. Pam McEwen. Are you on? Yes. Okay, would you like to give your report, please? Yes. Um, hopefully everybody is safe and healthy. Um, the Senior Center has been COVID-free this entire time. I'm happy to say, um, as well as the Boys and Girls Club. That's amazing. Um, what the, What is going on with the Senior Center is um, we had our fundraisers and brought in um, almost $1,200 for that for the November, December um, fundraisers. Um, our numbers are steady. Um, we have made the decision as of January 1st. 2021 our lunch contribution price will raise to three dollars that's um, the biggest news um, of all um, so we've been um, making the public aware so that they're not blindsided come january um, other than that uh, we are just looking forward to um, continuing to serve our seniors and staying healthy Any questions for me? Okay, thank you, Pam. Thank Next, you. You're welcome. Next is Ms. Nita McDaniel with MEDC. Good evening, everyone. Um, you should have received the full written report, uh, including financials and uh, economic indicators as you do each month. I hope you each receive that in PDF form. And under recruiting new business and industry, I don't really have any updates that I can really report on Project 221 or 710. However, I do have a new uh, potential new prospect that I'm scheduled for a virtual meeting on December the 17th to hear details of that project. So I'm hopeful that maybe that will generate um, some new activity for us. Uh, retail recruitment activity continues steady, but nothing that we can really um, talk about at this point. Um, an update for you on Bayou Bartholomew boat ramp. Uh, our county judge, Robert Aiken, has received the draft of the memorandum of agreement for the long-term maintenance of that boat ramp. Uh, we are now awaiting uh, the information back from RDOT, um, I'm sorry, RDOT, as to uh, whether that bridge has now been integrated into the 
project with the contractor who won the award for the bridge replacement. So um, once that's done and the judge uh, has a chance to really look through that memorandum of agreement, then we'll have updates uh, regarding where that project stands. Under uh, business and industry retention, um, I've been reporting to you about progress at the public rail access. Uh, it's a very busy place right now, and the good news is that the request that Interfor had submitted to their corporate headquarters regarding approval for a capital expenditure to construct a warehouse at the public rail access has been approved. So we will continue to work with them through the process of uh, deeding them property there adjacent to the public rail access for the construction of that warehouse. Um, our board of directors in our last month's meeting made amendments to our protective covenants on the uh, industrial park uh, to allow them, uh, we're basically waiving uh, setbacks between uh, the individual parcels within the industrial park because the rail access has grown to the point that we're integrating two of those individual parcels together and the warehouse will actually be constructed over the boundary line of the one. So all of those things have been cleared up and we're moving along with helping them to get started on construction of their warehouse. And what that means is they are transporting an awful lot of lumber out of Monticello by rail uh, as a result of our rail access project. Um, if you haven't driven out there, I encourage you to do so. Uh, it's at the very end of the cul-de-sac within the industrial park. So anytime you have a moment, just drive out there and take a look. Um, also on the business retention side, uh, later this month, I will be following up with one of our existing industries concerning a potential expansion. So we're busy on both sides with recruiting and retaining our uh, existing business and industry. Um, Dan Boyce had mentioned strategic planning, uh, the Community Catalyst Program Community Survey. Uh, it will uh, be announced in January with an official press release that will be generated in conjunction with uh, the University of Central Arkansas, Entergy, and uh, the city. So once we get that press release out there, uh, UCA has actually developed a very nice looking graphic it will be used through social media to uh, make that uh, electronic survey accessible to all of our people. And so we will be asking each of you um, to help us in getting that information out by sharing it on your personal, your business social media. Uh, the University of Arkansas at Monticello is uh, a strong partner in this community survey and they will be sharing that with their listserv of students and faculty as well because we want as many people to participate as possible. Um, they have just completed this survey process with Harrison and Harrison got a really great um, number of responses and we want to get as many as we possibly can in our community. So we will be asking for your help with that. And um, you can also see in my report our marketing information, the number of views that we've had digitally on our buildings and sites. Um, one additional thing that I've done this month, I've worked with the mayor. As you know, uh, the Scoggin Drive project will be moving forward in the coming year, and there's a lot that's attached to that. Um, one of those things is the overlayment through the partnering. Uh, agreement with the Department of Transportation to uh, overlay Main Street and Jefferson Street, which will then be turned back to the city as part of the city street system. Well, one of uh, the things that the mayor's been working on is getting the water and sewer lines, which are some of the oldest in the city. A lot of it is either cast iron or old Orangeburg sewer. Uh, we know that once milling happens to that street, it can disintegrate. So I have uh, generated a map that shows that project area and gave it to the mayor. She can use to give to the engineering firm 
where we can begin that process of planning for the moving of those water and sewer lines. And we've also identified possible grant sources that can, might, might be able to help the city offset uh, some of the cost of that particular project. So um, I'll continue to work with the mayor on that as much as I can. If she needs my help, I'm, I'm there to help. Um, also, just to give you an update from the Office of City Property Inspection, uh, Brian Rogers assisted 25 um, elderly and or disabled citizens of Monticello Drew County this month to put in an application uh, in partnership with Commercial Bank, Citizens Bank, and Union Bank for home preservation funds to fix their homes. Uh, so there were 25 of those applications worked that Brian did the inspections and uh, gathered bids from local contractors. So more housing preservation that's going on to help strengthen our uh, housing situation in our city and county. Um, with that, those are the highlights of my report, but not all of it. So if uh, you have a question about anything, I will be more than happy to answer. Yes, Nita, uh, this is Jack. Um, Mm -hmm. Exactly where is the location of the boat ramp on the bayou? Okay, it is on Highway 277. If you uh, take Highway 278 toward McGee, and instead of uh, making that sharp right turn to continue right. toward you go to the straight, yes, it, it is the bridge, the bridge that crosses. It's in close proximity to the historical property that the university has. So putting a boat ramp there is going to cause the university to have to do something about security, but uh, we'll handle well, it further. Actually, I think it's a little further away than you might think. Um, I'll have to look at that, Dr. Lester. If you would like for me to, I will do a map that shows the uh, route from the Hollywood Plantation to uh, the ramp where it would be located. Okay, yeah, that would be very useful for the university. They would, I appreciate that. I will do that. Um, I do know that there are a lot of obstructions, trees and so forth on the north end of that between where this ramp will go and uh, where the bayou is near uh, that dog trot uh, building. Um, so I know it will be a long time before a lot of boat traffic happens. But that's one of our hopes is that it will actually allow um, actually on the south end would be more beneficial to do work to clear some of those obstructions because in Ashley County there is um, a boat ramp access on Highway 82 um, okay. in just uh, to the west of Montrose so if we were able to get the boat ramp here open, literally people would have the opportunity to canoe, boat, uh, between those two accesses. Yeah, I think it's a wonderful opportunity. It just, uh, and obviously I don't have uh, anything to do with it at the university anymore, but I know in my time we spent almost two million dollars on that project through grants. I uh, want to continue to maintain the property so I'll make sure that Dr. Doss, she's actually got a commission uh, putting together a plan for the use of the property. So this Absolutely. will be Absolutely. And she's very aware of the boat ramp project as well, because as you know, she serves on the Monticello Economic Development Commission right. director. So she's definitely in the loop on that. And I will. That That's really a great idea. I'll generate a map for that. OK, thank you very much. Any other questions? Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Nita. Um, okay, next on the agenda is uh, Chief Jason Akers. Can you hear me, Mayor? I can. Good. I, I, I'm not sure where the camera's at on my, my computer, so I'm staring around into space. I promise I'm here. Uh, it's good to be with you folks tonight. It's good to see you again. Uh, all of you have the uh, statistics that we compiled. You know, we're, we're a data driven uh, in our work. We started keeping statistics in, uh, I believe, June of last year. But I'm going to submit to you a 12 month, I submitted to each of you a 12 month uh, outline of basically what we've done. 
uh, and it's got all of our miles and these are totaled up from patrol officers, uh, our citations, uh, our calls for service. Uh, we like to look at where we're, we don't know where we're going unless we're sure where we're at. So we, we kind of want to know uh, what types of progress we've made and we're really looking to, uh, uh, to expand on that a little further going into 2021. For those of you who, who have the, uh, the documentation, the graphs and charts that we presented, we prepared for you, it kind of explains kind of what we've done over the year. Uh, we had right at 200,000 miles of, of, of patrolling done in the city. We had around 4,000, a little over 4,000 uh, citations issued, average out to about 349 a month. We had uh, the total calls for service for the patrol division was a little over 16,000, almost 17,000, it was a 16.8 that averages out about 1403 a month. So those are calls for service where someone calls and requests an officer. So that's kind of to gives you an idea of what these guys are doing. You'll see on the charts, we kind of hit the, uh, during the COVID months, we had some drops, uh, but they they gradually picked back up and have, have uh, uh, kind of tapered off towards the end of the year. Our total felony arrests for the year were 243. Uh, we tracked the data. And if you compare this uh, with the domestic chart that's included, You'll notice that when we have a month of high felony arrests, those are typically drug arrests. And when we do that, we have a drop off for the next couple of months. Um, we were able to chart that with enough with enough months that we feel comfortable that that's a that's definitely a pattern. The neat thing with that is you also when we have high felony arrests, you look at the domestics and the domestics that month or the next month go down. Uh, and I know I harp on domestics a lot and, and I put a lot of emphasis on them because those are a lot. Those are important to us. Uh, because we have a lot of children that are victims in those. But also those are very dangerous calls, probably the most dangerous calls to law enforcement officers who are hurt or, or, or killed in the line of duty, they're domestic related. So that's important to us that we limit the number. And we're proud that in November we only had, uh, uh, I believe we had one or two maybe, uh, without looking at it offhand. Our total misdemeanor arrests were 787. Uh, the domestics, yes, in November we had two domestics. Uh, we, we had a low, uh, a recorded low of just one reported for the month of August. So that goes not just for the police department, but all the other entities that play a role in uh, reducing those uh, those offenses. And that's going to be the district court and their enforcement of, of, uh, of punishment for, for offenders in that. And it also goes to groups like Options who are uh, out there struggling and doing the best they can do uh, to provide victims of domestic violence with a place to go and a safe environment for their children. So working with options, working with the courts uh, and the efforts made by these officers, uh, that's, that's real progress. Our total accidents for the year, traffic accidents were 464 and that's high, um, but it's lower than what it was last year. And uh, as we've, I think uh, Mr. McCray and I were talking about, you know, if we reduce it down 30 accidents a month, or excuse me, 30 accidents a year, and you figure that the average is just uh, uh, $10,000 an accident, uh, that's chunk, and it makes our streets that much safer, and that's an opportunity for us to look at it. That's 30, 30 opportunities where someone wasn't hurt and that, that some innocent person didn't uh, uh, lose a family member or, or suffer some type of uh, uh, debilitating injury. So it doesn't sound like much, but in the grand scheme of things, when you look at it from that perspective, it is. Our fine intake for the year, I believe, around from November to November, uh, was uh, $311,383.58. Uh, that comes from uh, uh, not just traffic citations, but other mechanisms that are in place, collecting fees on warrants, uh, things like that. Our jail expense is the next to last page. We've gone over the four year, for those of you who reviewed this, there's a four year uh, charting of that. Uh, it started off at a high of 60, it reached a high of 71, 69, then last year was 43 and then 14,000. I think that that shows a couple of things. It's good management on the on the on the uh, part of the detectives. They're timely in getting their case files in. We're accruing less of the jail bill. There was some probably uh, uh, COVID probably pay, played a role with with the limited number this year of people that we uh, held in jail. One of the important aspects of that, though, and it's something that we've preached a long time. And and for those of you who agree with me on this, is that uh, you know we've come up with some alternate methods of uh, of dealing with jail. And sometimes jail's not the only answer. There are other answers and there are people that, uh, uh, that, that jail's not gonna help them. And so we've been exploring those. It's been uh, uh, fruitful for us. 
we're probably living, uh, in my opinion, and probably since I've been in Monticello since 2000, uh, probably one of the, it's, it's probably, I'll say that knock on wood, but it's one of the more peaceful times in our community. Uh, and that's evidence in the last, the last graph is our homicides. We tracked those for four years. Uh, it's in 2019 and 2020, we haven't had one. Um, and I'm, I'm usually, sometimes I'm reluctant to, 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 to say things like that because sure as you say, you don't have one, you have one. But I'm, I believe in what we're doing as a community and I believe in what we're doing as a department. And I believe that the way that the officers are out there dealing with the community, establishing rapport with the community, uh, that plays a role in that. And, and we're not tolerating, uh, 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 we're not tolerating violence. Anytime there's a, a, a violent crime that occurs, we address it quickly, we address it swiftly and uh, we put a stop to it. And that is the, the uh, something to brag on these patrolmen with. They're out there working and they're out there doing their job. We had our, uh, in other news, we had our typical, typically every year we do our shop with a cop program uh, where we take children, some disadvantaged children, and we take them shopping. Uh, due to COVID and some other concerns we had, we did things a little bit different this way. We, this year we took the money uh, and we have bought duffel bags and uh, other items to fill the duffel bags uh, for foster children. Uh, it, it, like I said, COVID's changed everything and the amount of exposure uh, publicly and out, you know, with, with groups and that kind of stuff, we're doing our part to, to limit that. But a lot of these foster children are going from home to home and their clothes are in trash bags, Walmart sacks, paper sacks, and that kind of stuff. And uh, the police department came up with the idea, let's do something for these children who are uh, uh, dealing with uh, some things that none of us uh, could ever imagine dealing with. So what we did was we worked with finance and we got it approved and, and made sure that we were okay on the financial end and with Walmart, and with DHS, we got the kids duffel bags. So when they do have to move from place to place, that they have something to put their clothes in, their personal belongings in, uh, gives them a little sense of of, uh, of, of of dignity, and and that's what we're uh, that's what we're trying to do there. Other than that, uh, any are there any questions about our stats before we move on? I got one other thing to say, and then other, any questions for from any of the council, mayor? Good. Uh, one of the things I'd like to say, and then I'll close, it's uh, Dr. Lassiter. It has been a pleasure working with you. Uh, I know this is your last meeting, but I've enjoyed it. Uh, and I appreciate your support and your guidance on the issues that we've talked about. And Joe Meeks, wherever you are, I don't see your face, but we've known each other about what seems to be about 100 years. And it's been nothing but a pleasure. Uh, uh, I love you guys, and I appreciate your, your efforts and your service to your community. Probably didn't always agree, probably won't always agree, but I'm proud that uh, we've always been able to uh, uh, to work together and you guys have been a big help to me coming in. So I just want to tell you thank you from me uh, to you. So, and from the police department, the entire police department. When I speak, I say that for all of us. We thank you, thank you for your service. Thank you, Jason, I appreciate that. Y'all keep doing a good job and uh, hopefully you'll have a better 2021. Hope so. 2020, can, it, it can only get better. That's right. Thank you, Jason. I appreciate all you and your uh, staff do. I think we all should have a sense of pride in our police department. They are outstanding. Thank you, Dr. Lester. On that note, I would like to, uh, Jason, don't go anywhere. I would like to let you all know that um, our officer, Jerome Perez, was recognized by the Drew County NAACP for leadership in community service. Officer David Minotti was promoted to Master Sergeant in the U.S. Air Force Reserves. And Governor Hutchinson uh, appointed our own Chief Jason Akers to replace Chief Hayes Minor on the uh, Arkansas Alcohol and Drug Abuse Coordinating Council. Um, I think that's quite an honor, and I want to make sure Monticello knows what an awesome police department we have. Thank you, Mayor. Great job. Thank you. Congratulations to all. Thank, Thank you. Thank you all. And I, I wanted to do that last, last time we were gathered together, but, well, yeah, I don't see you weren't there, and uh, anyway, now we're virtual, so we, <laughs> well, I had to go ahead and do it. <laughs> Thank you, Jason. Yes, ma'am. Okay, next is a report from Charlie Hammock, if he's on. 
Can you hear me, Mayor? I can. All right. well, this week, well, this month has been kind of slow. We uh, we had a few water leaks. We only had a few employees because we had a bunch of them that was quarantined. But we did make it with the, the leaks that we had with the garbage truck drivers and uh, the meter readers helping me. Uh, we made it. We got both of them fixed. And uh, we managed to get the trash and meters read and the leaks fixed. You know, being shorthanded, but we did make it, and we, I got some of the guys back, so we're we're picking up. Any questions for Charlie? Good job, Charlie. Thanks, sir. I will add that we did resume uh, leaves and limbs pickup and special pickup this week. Um, we, well, that will happen tomorrow, so that'll be on our Facebook page to inform. Um, everybody. Um, anyway. Hey, Char hey, Charlie. This is Joe. Yes. Um, down in front of Walgreens, there there seems to be quite a bit of water uh, there around the curve, like where the flagpole is. Is that a yes, leak sir. on Walgreens? Or is that a, okay? So it's not a city leak. No, sir. I think it's one, I think it's on them, but I will double check and make sure. Thank you, sir. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Joe. Okay, anybody else have any questions for Charlie? All right, next we'll go to Parks Commission. Um, Tyler, are you here? Tyler James? Taryn, do you know if he's on? I don't know if he's on. Okay, I can't see a, a list of folks so all right well, we'll just move on to uh new business and coincidentally um, mr seth givens from Vera memorial hospital has just uh arrived so um we'll let you all listen to what he and i think amanda's with him have to say and um then you can ask questions when he's finished seth can you hear me I can. Can you all hear me? Yes. Excellent. I'm sorry about all the technical difficulties, but we're in. Um, I'm Seth Givens, Chief Operating Officer at Drew Memorial. Just wanted to give you folks uh, an update on recent testing of COVID-19 patients and kind of what our census is looking like right now. And then I have asked my colleague, Amanda Mitchell, to join me. She's the Director of Laboratory and she's going to speak to you about the types of COVID testing that are available, uh, both nationwide and then, of course, within our hospital health system, and um, some CDC guidance about when you should be tested. So just going to give you a frame of reference. For months now, we have been running around um, somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 to 35 patients on the, as an average daily census. Uh, within that average daily census, we would at times have as many as four patients or at most four patients that might be po positive for COVID-19, um, but it never seemed to climb any higher than that. Um, just to kind of give you an idea, in November of the tests that were conducted in-house, and that's our inpatient patients, um, only 12% or less were positive. For COVID-19. Those that came through our ER were around 36%, and then those that were coming from the clinic were around 25% from uh, Monticello Medical Clinic. We conduct their COVID testing for them and do um, a number of reference labs for them. Directly following the Thanksgiving holiday, we returned to eight positive patients that Monday. The next day, it went to 16. The next day, it was at 27 and has exponentially climbed um, throughout the last 14 days, roughly, from uh, that holiday. So just the um, those two weeks following Thanksgiving, we saw ER positive stay pretty close to the same in the 35, 36% range, but our in-house tests went up to 28%. Um, our clinic testing went from 25 to 34% positive. Um, and that may not seem like a huge leap but when we're running an average daily census of between 30 to 35 patients, 
Um, here lately, we've been running closer to 40 patients per day that are staying in-house. And of those, 65 to 80% of them have been positive with COVID-19. This morning, we had 29 patients on our roster or our census for this morning. 20 of those 29 were COVID positive. So that is very uh, significant in that the surge has hit through county. It has hit our community. It has hit our area. Um, when the surge began that week following Thanksgiving, we instituted what we call our emergency preparedness plan, where we did a little bit of lockdowns. We have uh, revised our visitor policy to limit those patients um, receiving visitors to only be if the patient is a child, that it's a minor, they need someone with them, obviously. If the patient is a laboring mother that is giving birth, we're allowing one visitor with that patient. And if the patient is someone that would be deemed as total care, uh, this is someone that's not competent to make decisions for themselves or not capable of um, receiving and retaining that, the information needed to make appropriate decisions about their health care, we would allow a caregiver or, or visitor with that patient. Outside of that, we have asked that no other, pa no other visitors enter the facility or vendors. Uh, we have our director of materials management working directly with our vendors. That, that is on an absolutely emergent basis only that we allow them on site. For example, if a piece of machinery breaks down that is needed for the course of doing business, we'll allow that vendor to come on site to work on that piece of machinery or equipment or instrument of whatever kind. So, um, we are anticipating that the surge it may die down probably around the middle of January. Um, what we suspect, of course, I don't have proof to back that up, but um, just directly following Thanksgiving, a lot of people gathered, probably did not adhere to social distancing guidelines or wear their masks, and so there was a higher exposure rate, um, which led to a higher positivity rate, and we're seeing that. As we are almost at Christmas and two weeks past Thanksgiving, we are starting to see some of those numbers come back down, but I would suspect that if at Christmas we see what we saw at Thanksgiving, then we'll see another peak. Um, and then by mid-January, we should start to see it slow, slow down again. Um, before I move on, I just want to stop and answer any questions that the council may have just about what our inpatient census looks like, what COVID testing looks like for us as a, an institution before um, I comment on the vaccine. Anybody right, have any questions? No? Okay. Well, Madam Mayor, I'll keep going then. Uh, we have, um, we are anticipating the first arrival of 50 vaccines tomorrow. Those will be administered to the employees that are providing direct patient care uh, and our physicians, um, those that of course are willing to take the vaccine. So similarly, when you get an, a flu uh, vaccine or a shingle shot or uh, any vaccine, there's always a likelihood that you may have an adverse reaction or that you may become symptomatic. Uh, many people say that when they get a flu shot, they feel flu symptoms following the flu shot. Um, we anticipate, and from all the literature that we're receiving, we uh, expect that that will that will be this will be no different. Those receiving a vaccine will feel symptomatic. Um, so we have to strategically administer those vaccines to staff in such a way that the staff can work off. For example. If we receive the vaccine on Wednesday and we can start administering it to staff on Thursday, we need to be prepared for that staff that's receiving the vaccine to be out for the next few days in case they are not feeling well, um, rather than to give it to everyone one day and the next day there'll be no employees available to work. Um, and so that is kind of our protocol for now for internal for the staff. We will see uh, physicians and, staff, uh, and direct patient care workers start to receive it. We will receive another 50 vials. We've been allotted so far 100. We will administer those to our staff. Uh, we are working in concert with the local primary care clinics to uh, set up um, a spot on our campus so that when the vaccine becomes available to the public, that we can not only educate the public about the vaccine, but also administer it on our campus, maybe through some kind of mechanism where people can drive through 
receive their vaccine, park. We can monitor them for 15 minutes to ensure that they're not having an adverse reaction of some kind where they need immediate emergent attention in the emergency room um, and then move on from there. Uh, but there's more information to come about that. Uh, that's just kind of maybe a teaser, I guess, to let you know that there is a vaccine coming, that uh, frontline workers will be receiving that first. And when the protocol is available for the general population, we are preparing with the local physicians to administer that. Any questions for me about our hospital or our, what we're doing about COVID? before I turn it over to my colleague to talk about our testing options right now. Well, thank you, Seth. Absolutely. Amanda, are you available to talk to the group about testing? Yes. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Um, I'm the lab director. I'm just going to talk about a few different types of testing that you probably talked about. Okay, Amanda, we're, I can't understand what you're saying. It's kind, of, it's kind of fading in and out. Um, anybody have a suggestion about what she might can do to make the sound better? All right, let's try it again, Amanda. Let me dive in, if you can all still hear me. Amanda may be in a bad spot. Madam Mayor, can you still hear me? Yes, I can. And it, and it sounded like she was in a bad spot, so. Okay. Um, uh, she's texting me now saying, I'm sorry, I, I've lost some service. Okay, so uh, yes, I will, I will dive in to um, tell you about our testing options. So there are three types of COVID testing. The first is called an antigen test. It is commonly known as the rapid test. We've heard a lot in the news about this test. It results within 15 minutes of uh, being processed. It is a simple nasal swab where um, the swab is, is inserted into the nasal cavity barely and there's a quick swab and that test is ran. It has very low confidence because it only produces a true positive if the um, patient being tested has become symptomatic within the appropriate window and that those that, that, um, that that the specimen can actually capture that the person has the virus build up to the appropriate level. If tested too soon, it may give you a false positive or a false negative. If tested too late, it could give you the same thing. It's the best window is within five to seven days, but even those don't always provide us the best result. That's called the rapid test it's, or antigen. Um, the second type of test is called the PCR. It is the golden standard. This is conducted by what's called a nasal pharyngeal swab. If any of you on the call have had this swab, you will never forget having had this done. The swab goes in the navel, nasal cavity to the back of the throat, which you feel like it's actually going into your brain. Um, it's quite uncomfortable and both sides have to be swabbed. This test allows the, um, it ran in-house, it is ran on a machine that's called the Cepheid, and that machine can produce results that are accurate within 45 minutes. So what uh, our goal is, is from the time the patient is swabbed to until they're resulted is a time frame of within 60 minutes. We want to know if that person is positive or negative. And that, again, is the golden standard. It's called a PCR test. So... Uh, there is an additional option there where if we are unable to run that test in-house for whatever reason, we have to ship that swab out to a reference lab, a nationally loan reference lab such as Quest Diagnostics, um, and those results can take 24 to 48 hours, just however long it takes that reference lab to run that sample. But if we have the materials and are able to run it in-house, we can produce the result within an hour. 
and I'll come back to that. So I'm just going to stick a pin in that point for just a moment. The third type of test is called an antibody test. This is a blood draw that's ran on a chemistry analyzer, and it will test the blood for signs of antibodies for someone who may have had COVID. They may pro have produced antibodies. Those are typically not seen in patients who have been uh, who have been more or been less than three weeks since symptoms. So, for example, if you had COVID-19 and you have now been symptom uh, symptom free for more than three weeks, you may be a candidate to have a blood draw and see if you actually have the antibodies in your system. Maybe you were never tested for COVID, but you were just really, really sick and you had all the telltale signs and symptoms of COVID, but never were tested. To find out if you had it after the fact, you could have that test done. It's still very new, so we don't know how long the antibodies last. We still don't know if um, what presence of antibodies keep you from getting COVID-19 again. There's still a lot to learn uh, because of how new the disease is. So I said I would put a, a pin in that middle point on PCR testing. You've got the rapid, you've got the PCR, you've got the antibody. PCR is obviously what we prefer because that is accurate. We were uh, recipients of a grant from Arkansas Blue Cross's Blue and You Foundation that they purchased us an analyzer to test for COVID by PCR. At the same time, they were manufacturing swabs to use on that machine. They redesigned their swab so that you could swab a patient with one swab and you could run a test on that machine and it would tell you if they had flu, if they had RSV, if they had COVID. So in order to make the machine more efficient, they stopped manufacturing the COVID swab about the time we got the machine. So we received the machine where we're now able to test, but we don't have the materials that we need to test with because they're making a new type of material, this new swab. Well, right now, because those swabs are so limited from the manufacturers, we are only receiving an allocation of 40 swabs a month. That means only 40 patients can get that one-hour accurate test. Everyone else to get the accurate test has to wait 24 to 48 hours to get the result from the time that they're swabbed, which can be difficult, obviously, if someone's quarantining, having to take off from work, if they have children that are being uh, quarantined or symptomatic, those kinds of things. I mean, time's of the essence. The more we know, the quicker we know, the sooner we can start being treated appropriately for it. Nonetheless, that's beyond our control. What else is beyond our control is that the manufacturer only sends us those allocations as they are ready. So they may have told us, we can get you guys 40 swabs a month. It may be six weeks before we receive our next shipment because that's as soon as those swabs were ready. By January, their manufacturer is anticipating that their swab production will be up where they can fulfill orders faster and in larger quantity because there is such a high demand nationwide for this testing material. So in short, those are the three types of tests that are available nationwide. We have all three types available to our population that we serve. The problem is, is that the rapid test is very unreliable, and so it is not recommended, that 15-minute test. Unless we catch you at the exact right moment, we may not get a true result. The PCR test we have available, but in limited supply for swabs. Other than that, we swab and we have to send out to a reference lab and then wait the 24 to, 30, to 48 hours for results. We have the chemistry analyzer equipment and we can do the antibody test, which is the blood draw. So all of that is available here at Drew Memorial, right here in Monticello. Now, um, just as an aside, um, testing tips would be, if you have been potentially exposed to someone with COVID-19, it is not recommended that you go be tested immediately. You may not contract the virus. You may not become symptomatic with the virus. The best recommendation is to isolate, and then if you become symptomatic within five days, be tested. If you do not become symptomatic within five days, your best bet is that you don't have it. 
unnecessary testing, one, it's uncomfortable, so I wouldn't want to go through that unless I absolutely had to. But two, is a strain on the supplies that are already currently high, in high demand and difficult to get. So we can do it, but if you really don't need it, you may not want to go that route unless you become symptomatic. Obviously, um, as we've been being told for the last nine months by the CDC, our best, best defenses are all um, offenses. Wear your masks, wash your hands, use hand sanitizer, social distance from others, as much as possible, I know this has been very difficult, uh, especially for uh, around this time of year where we want to gather and we want to be with others. Um, those are the, the best things that we can do on the offensive side to avoid the continued spread or, or contracting it ourselves. So let me just kind of pause there. I've said a lot. Are there questions about testing, testing equipment, or what we're doing for testing at the hospital? Seth, there is a question in the comments from Dr. Hilton. She's asking if local educators will get the vaccine before the general public. I'm sorry, could you repeat that question for me? I'm sorry, can you hear me? I can hear you. It was just a little muffled, if you can repeat that. Okay. Um, Dr. Hilton in the comments is asking if local educators will get the vaccine before the general public. I am I am not as familiar with the protocols that are coming down from the Arkansas Department of Health with the distribution of that. From what I understand from our pharmacy director and the physicians that are involved in this is that the frontline healthcare workers will receive this first, nursing homes second. I don't know that educators fall in a third category before the general public, but I think that's a great question and I'm glad to take that back and, and get a response. Thank you. Absolutely. Any, Any other, other questions, questions for Seth? Seth? Okay, well, Seth and Amanda, um, I really appreciate your taking the time to uh, inform us and educate us a little bit more um, it's a, a very trying time for all of us, but especially our hospitals and our, our physicians and our nursing staff and um, people who are literally on the front lines of dealing with this pandemic. So um, thank you very much for the information and please feel free to join us any anytime again. Absolutely. And thank you, Madam Mayor. If I, if I could just very quickly, uh, two quick things is that um, I would encourage those that are concerned about um, the safety of the vaccine to talk to your primary care doctor if you have any concerns about any health conditions that you have and if there's any potential side effects that you're concerned about about receiving the vaccine second and even more importantly especially this time of year is i want to on behalf of the administration the staff and the physicians at drew memorial i want to thank all of you for your continued support to our staff um, they're exhausted. They have worked, especially the last few weeks where we have seen such an uptick in positive cases. It has been a daunting process. Uh, we saw it on the news. We didn't think it would come to us, but it's here. Um, and it has really been motivating and moving at the same time to see our staff come together and deliver such high quality care to our patients um, and our family members and our community members in such a way while their own families are, are dealing with this at home. So I just want to thank you for your continued prayer, your continued support um, of, of our local healthcare workers. They, they really are doing a bang up job right now. And it's just really, like you said, Madam, it's just really a tough time for everyone. But thank you all for everything that you've done for the hospital and your continued support of our staff. Of course, and uh, I'll speak for the entire council. Um, you will have our continued prayers and our continued support um, anything we can do to help you all through this horrible issue, um, just let us know. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, next is a discussion about our 2019 legislative audit. Um, I'll read the results. 
Um, okay, a priority of Arkansas legislative audit is to assist local government officials by promoting sound financial management and accountability of government resources. The legislative auditor reports the legislative auditor reports on the fiscal affairs of local governments as well as compliance with relevant state laws and observance of good business practices to provide accountability for tax dollars expended to support government operations. We've performed certain limited procedures with respect to cash basis financial information and compliance with certain state laws and accepted accounting practices for the city of Monticello. As of and for the year ended December 31st, 2019, and have issued a report thereon dated September 17, 2020. These procedures were not performed for the water, sewer, and solid waste funds. Management of the city is responsible for maintaining the financial records and complying with state laws and accepted accounting practices. The commentary contained in this section relate to the following officials who held office during 2019. Mayor Paige Chase, Clerk Jessica Hilton, Finance Director Vicki Norris, District Court Clerk Julie Watkins, Police Chief Jason Akers. We evaluated the city's compliance with certain state laws concerning general and district court accounting, budgeting, purchasing and investing, and depositing of public funds. During our evaluation, nothing came to our attention that would warrant disclosure in this report. And that's it. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, I would just like to say that I think this is the first report I have heard that had no comments. <laughs> congratulations. I think too, and that is uh, mostly congratulations to Ms. Vicki Norris. Congratulations, Vicki. It takes the whole group. Good job. Thank you. Thank you to Thank you for listening, department heads. <laughs> okay, next we have a discussion regarding the EFS proposals. Uh, Michael Gilbert, are you on? Yes, ma'am. Can you hear me? I can now. So I'm going to mute my mic and let you speak, okay? Okay. All right, y'all ready? Um, so what we provided to the city is a packet of three proposals, um, and I'll, I'll sort of go through these at um, what I would consider order of importance. The the first one, the first one being a um, proposal for redistricting service. Um, this this proposal is, and I, I believe it's pulled up there on the bottom. Um, the the redistricting proposal is um, due to the the 2020 census that has just been completed. Redistricting is a responsibility of the city council to look at your population as it has changed across the city and to redistrict, rebalance your city ward boundary. Um, we uh, we completed this project actually back in 2010 for the city and the county. Um, and we're, we're proposing to provide the services again, where we would take the census block data and uh, first phase would be to um, actually take the census block data and compare it to your existing city ward boundaries and find out what the balance is across the city and across each ward. Um, at that point, the, the report would be given to city council and then you along with um, uh, input from your, your city council and the uh, city attorney you would look at the, the balance of your city wards and the population of each ward and determine if the wards need to be redistricting. Um, that, that redistricting process is what we call phase two down there. And that, um, that would be where we would go through, do a, a couple, typically we do three options for the city council to uh, consider uh, as part of the redistricting plan. We present those back to city council and then you can take those options and um, adjust those as needed or as suggested across the city. Um, are there any questions on the district? Okay, Mr. 
do we have an idea of how this was handled the last time the census was completed? Um, I can go back and look and see what the changes look like, sir. I, uh, it was pretty the, much handled the same way that you are explaining now. Yes, but it was the exact same process. We're, we're uh, proposing the exact same process. If um, I remember, there were three, at least three uh, proposals, and the council uh, chose chose one. Yes, Ms. Hartness, and the, um, like I said, we would present those options back to you. First, first presentation would be just on what your existing wards, what the population is for those wards. And then uh, Mr. Barton and, and I'm sure we'll be involved in that discussion um, as far as if rebalance was needed, if uh, redistricting was needed. From that. I guess, did EFS conduct the study 10 years ago? Yes, sir, we did. Um, we, we the, the t 10 years ago in 2010, that was the first year that redistricting was done in a digital format. Um, Prior to that, the, the years before, redistricting was always done on, on paper maps and colored pencils. That's basically the old story. Um, and uh, in 2010, the state uh, led the state uh, of Arkansas across all districts to do that in a very digital format. And EFS, uh, we, we were prepared then and are prepared again to just provide those services. Any other questions on redistricting? Okay. Um, the, the, another proposal that we provided, uh, as, as I, I hope you all know, EFS, we, a, a primary part of our business is aerial photography. Um, we have provided aerial photography for Drew County and the city of Monticello over multiple years, and typically every three to four years. Um, the, the last time the city was flown was in 2017, and, and we flew that. We actually did that project for the county, um, but uh, this year we're proposing to the city to fly uh, updated high-resolution aerial photography over the city uh, for planning purposes, for mapping purposes, uh, the, the maps that Ms. Nita mentions, and, and all those different maps that uh, Mr. Charlie and all the other uh, departments use here in the city, uh, EDGE, uh, that that uh, aerial photography will be used uh, for those purposes. Uh, just as a side note, the county is being flown also this year by us. Uh, we just got approval on that last night. Uh, we will be flying the county at a, at a high resolution, but not quite as high of a resolution as what we're proposing to the city. Um, and so when you, inside of the city limits of, of Monticello, we would, we would come back over the top of it with higher detailed um, flight and then provide that energy back to the city. Um, and you can see that proposal there. Um, are there any questions on aerial photography? You'll see the, the proposal there for that. Um, like I said, that this is a we this is this coming up, we're we're going into our busy season, which is leaf off when, when aerial photography. And uh, the best time to fly aerial photography for cities and counties, those types of projects, is in the winter when the leaves are off the trees, especially in a, uh, a compact populated space such as a city. Uh, it's really helpful uh, when the, the trees get foliated. It's hard to see some of those um, some of those features on the ground that you need to see for mapping purposes, um, which leads me into our third proposal, which was uh, generated through the Planning Commission, which uh, Mr. Boyce mentioned earlier. Uh, we have multiple. Uh, proposals within this proposal, and I believe that was in the first page that, uh, I'm not sure if Taryn who had that up there, um, but what we're proposing, and this is all input from the Planning Commission, uh, Mr. Boyce, Mr. Eccles, and multiple ones have visited with us. We actually pre presented out there, it's been several months ago now, Mr. Boyce, but uh, we did present out to the uh, Planning Commission. They come back with some requests for this proposal from us, and so what we're looking at is creating multiple, uh, when we say layers, it's data, data sets on the map, okay? Uh, just think of streets, think of addresses, think of fire hydrants as a layer. Uh, some other layers that they're looking at, uh, I won't go through the whole list there, but uh, trails and sidewalks. Um, a, a big one will be public property. Uh, the, the land use layer, which is looking at how 
how property, uh, how space is used in the city currently. Uh, that's a big part of this proposal. And then, um, if I remember correctly, the, the biggest pro part of this project would be a utilities network map, which uh, the mayor and I visited about this, um, uh, Mr. Charlie and I visited about this. That's going to be the most extensive part of this project, um, is trying to map out our, our utility network, our water and our sewer lines and all the things that go in with that. Uh, our utilities department, they have a lot of uh, paper maps currently, flat maps, uh, from what I understand, out at the uh, Public Works building that Mr. Charlie said that we could we could get with him and, and get a copy of those and then try to work to to digitize those maps to the best best of our ability. And then there's going to be areas that I'm just going to have to work with Mr. Charlie um, on a one on one basis to get some areas updated that there are just not paper maps available on. Um, mm -hmm. that, that is the most extensive part of this project uh, that that we have here on this proposal. And in all of these layers, as I've mentioned to the mayor and I've mentioned to Mr. Boyce, all of these projects can be done independently of each other. Uh, we could work on, let's say, the first three layers uh, first and then come back at a later point and work on the utilities or, or something like that or some combination of them. Or we could start working in January and uh, work through it and finish it in de next December. You know, it just really depends on how how the city and the planning commission wants to guide us on these projects. Um, but uh, we have the, the staffing and the abilities to, to complete these projects and uh, it would be a, a pretty, uh, some of our guys would enjoy working on it here in our local town. So um, if there's any questions on that, I'd be more than happy to answer those as well. Uh, is the aerial proposal dependent upon being completed to do any of these other projects that are listed here? No, sir. Uh, we can, you know, even the sidewalk mapping, we have, like I said, we have, uh, we have high resolution imagery of the city from 2017. I'm not sure, let's say the side, for instance, the sidewalks is just the one I used. I'm not sure how many sidewalks have been added since 2017. Now having updated high resolution aerial photography is definitely going to help. Um, I, I, there's no doubt about that for all of these projects. Uh, the the land use um, project, we're looking to see if something's residential or if it was vacant back in 2017, you know, those types of things. Uh, updated aerial photography is always helpful uh, for these things, but it is independent of it, sir. Once you have completed the layers, is there a way to update Yes, sir. So those layers will be, as they're completed, they will be loaded into the city's edge map that they're using currently. Uh, I'm not sure if you recall when I was there, I guess it was back earlier this year, um, I presented from the edge map and it would be loaded into that, that digital web map that the city uses for all things mapping here in the city. We're very proud of that. And uh, the, the city could maintain, manage, update, uh, delete, change, whatever they want to do on all these layers from, from edge. Michael, go back to the second proposal, the digital aerial photography proposal. Yes, ma'am. That fee is half of the fee, right? We're sh we split that fee with the county? No, no, ma'am. So that is the that is the aerial photography for the city. Okay, the okay. county has their own bill, and it's it's uh, okay. much more significant than that bill um, to fly the entire county. Okay. <laughs> If the city chose not to complete this, but I'm just going to be completely open here. If the city chose not to complete this project, there will still be aerial photography of the city of Monticello from this year because the county is flying it. It's just not going to be that high resolution, that high detail that we're talking about in this proposal for the $6,200. Okay, I understand. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Anybody else have any other questions? Okay, Mr. Gilbert, are you, have you got anything else you want to add or? Hey, I don't think so. Hey, I, I will say, uh, Mayor, that as we spoke, the uh, planning uh, software that's in EDGE, uh, I've been out there training multiple times with Terry, just so that the city council knows um, that is in place now. Uh, we are really proud of that product and uh, happy that 
proud to do for the city. And we're thankful to you all for allowing us to do that. So uh, thank you for that project. And uh, we look forward to continue working with the city and working with the communities. You're welcome. Thank you. We, I have not heard any yelling or screaming from Taryn's office or her desk, so I think it's working really well. <laughs> well, I, I told her I'm here to help her. Don't cuss me. Call me and we'll, we'll work. <laughs> I think she'll do that. <laughs> Thank you very much. And have a Merry Christmas. I neglected right. to say that to everybody else that's left the meeting, but have a, have a Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, you guys. Thank you for having me tonight. Thank you. Okay, um, I have, would like to inform you that uh, Chris Knott with Arkansas Game and Fish has been working his fingers to the bone on the lake and um, making our lake better for fishing. Um, he, this, let's see, I think it was two weeks ago, he, they built, I think it was him and one other guy, built 120 double pallet pyramids um, and used about 700 pallets. Um, that's just one of the few times he's been out there. I think he said they cut, uh, hinge cut about, I don't know, hundreds of trees. Um, so they are continuing to work every month on uh, making that lake a better lake for fishing. And then um, I, I have one other thing I'd like to say. I'd like to thank um, two of our gentlemen who will be leaving us formally. Um, they'll no longer be on our council. That's Joe Meeks and Dr. Jack Lassiter. But they'll continue to be our citizens. And they'll be citizens who have a whole lot of knowledge about our city government. And I want them to know how much I appreciate their active participation, their attendance, their willingness to do the research and get the job done and help whoever and whatever needs to be helped. They've listened to me and they've been a sounding board for me and I'm sure others have uh, had that same experience with these two gentlemen. Um, they'll continue to be valuable citizens because they understand how the gears have to turn and because they care um, and they sincerely care about our city. Mr. Meeks has been on council for 11 years uh, in Ward 3 and Dr. Lassiter for a little over a year in Ward 4. And I want you two to know that I will miss you and I'm very, very, very happy to have been able to work with you like I have. Um, and I really sincerely appreciate everything you've done to help Monticello be a better place. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, it was a pleasure serving the citizens of Monticello and working with everybody and uh, good luck to the council in 21 and, and especially to the new council coming on. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. And I also would like to thank you, Mayor and uh, fellow council members for uh, a quick education in city government. Uh, I regret that I only served a little over a year, but I sure learned a lot. And uh, even though I'm going off the council, I've already told the mayor that I'm available. I feel like I still have a little bit of a debt to pay to this city and the citizens for all they've done for me and my family and the place that where I worked uh, for almost 30 years. So uh, thank you for, again, this wonderful experience. Thank you, Dr. Lassiter. Okay, the only other thing I'd like to say is you all please have a Merry Christmas and please be very safe. Um, I will be excited to see you all in the new year healthy. And um, we've got a little bit left to do this month, but uh, after that, we'll be starting a new year and starting new, hopefully a new attitude, and a new, <laughs> with no pandemic, maybe, maybe that will go away soon too. <laughs> lots of, lots of anticipation for 2021. <laughs> Madam okay. Mayor. Yes. If I may have the pleasure of one last time. You may. I move to adjourn. I move to adjourn. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Reeks. Can I get a second? Second. All those in favor.
Uh, all right. Thank you all right. very much. Merry Christmas to all. Christmas to you. Christmas to everyone. Good night. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Thank you.